Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teals of Continuing Church of God. Today I'd like to do the second part of a multi-part, a seven-part series on the seven churches of Revelation. A while back we did the first one on the Ephesus church era, and today we're going to try to cover the Smyrna church era. And I say try to cover because I looked at my notes, and I actually have three times the amount of notes that I need to, uh, to fill the amount of time I usually do for a sermon. So we're not going to do all of that. Uh, we're not going to go through all the, all the detail here, but I guess I'll mention at the beginning, uh, if you want some detail that I don't go into, I, you go to the cogwriter.com website and there's an article called the Smyrna Church Era. Now, I've wanted to talk about the Smyrna Church Era for a long, long time for a lot of different reasons. This, the Smyrna Era is the second one in the book of Revelation, and it kind of helps to answer a question. And this uh, will maybe be interesting to you. My uh, wife and I flew out to uh, uh, New Jersey uh, earlier this week, and sitting next to me, uh, across from me, was uh, a Catholic uh, scholar kind of guy. He's not a priest, he was a married guy. We had a master's and a bachelor's in, in divinity. And we were talking, he started asking some questions about religion, and I found out what he did and all. And one of the things he said was, What's your authority for understanding the Bible? And he was saying the Protestants don't have any authority and they don't agree on anything and whatever. And I said, well, we believe what the Bible teaches and we believe we're supposed to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, as it says in Jude, chapter, Jude, Jude verse 3. And I said, one of the ways we do this is by looking at what the apostles taught or at least what the apostles followers taught. Now, as far as what the apostles taught, you can read that in this book, because they wrote various books in the New Testament. But how was that understood? You've got people these days who point to this divinity school or that scholar or whatever, and they try to tell you that what the New Testament means. Now, it was originally written in Koine Greek, and it's been translated in this language to us in English. And people think, because they think this English word means this, this, word, this is what this means, and therefore this is what it means, and it's not true. Well, what's this got to do with the Smyrna church era? Quite a bit. Why? These people knew the people who, either they knew the apostles, or they knew people who knew the apostles. All right? Plus, Koine Greek was their native language. So guess what? Yes, they understood it better than any scholar alive today, because they were there back then. Now, traditionally, the Church of God has taught that the Ephesus church era lasted until about 135 A.D., 135 A.D. is when Jerusalem fell uh, because of uh, what's called the Bar Kokhba revolt, when the Jews thought this other guy was the Messiah. And basically what happened is Emperor Hadrian, Roman Emperor Hadrian, didn't like this revolt. And he said the Jewish were not allowed back in Jerusalem. He didn't say the Jews, but the Jewish. And Christians were given a choice. Christians were given a choice. If you want to go to Jerusalem... You live in there, and you just say you always live there. If you'll eat unclean meats, and you'll do stuff on Sunday, and you don't do Passover on the 14th and stuff like this, it's okay. Then you can live in Jerusalem. But if you otherwise, you can't do that. So there was a split in 135 A.D. in Jerusalem. And our people were not allowed in Jerusalem because we didn't follow this uh, Latin by David Marcus. And so traditionally, the Church of God has said that's kind of the break between the Ephesus era of the church and the Smyrna era of the church. And by the way, we have an article on church eras that you can read at the cogwriter.com website as well. Well, let's go to the Bible, and then we'll go to some more things about the Smyrna church era. Now, Smyrna is in Asia Minor, and I probably should have brought uh, something else, but instead of, you're stuck at seeing my hand as a map, which I do a lot. If, Smyrna look, if Asia Minor looks like this, uh, Ephesus was right around here, and Smyrna is right about here. And my wife Joyce and I visited, by the way, all the seven churches of Revelation, so we've been to Smyrna. Matter of fact, uh, this picture probably doesn't come out very well, but uh, Joyce took that when we were there in 2008. We've actually been to Smyrna twice. Anyway, I'd like to read from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 8, and it says, And the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who is dead and came to life, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, 
but are the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now notice that the Smyrna church was a faithful church and it had to deal with false Christians, which were uh, people who claimed they were Jews and they weren't. Same thing, by the way, said to the Philadelphians. We're not going to read that right now, but that's further in Revelation chapter 3. Now it says the Smyrna church is going to suffer persecution. Now this was not the great tribulation. The 10 days, historically have been interpreted as 10 years, and the time of the great tribulation, the day of the Lord is... Uh, uh, three and a half, and so this is not the this is not that. Now, we in the continuing Church of God consider the Smyrna era particularly important. And we do this for a couple of different reasons. One is we can trace a lot of our early history from there. It's basically been understood that the Apostle John left Jerusalem and ended up eventually in Ephesus. Now, when he wrote Revelation, Revelation 1 says he was an island called Patmos, which, by the way, my wife Joyce and I visited there once. And that's just off the coast of Asia Minor, and that's when he was exiled. But after his exile was over, according to non-biblical sources, he was in Ephesus. And so that's, that's where he was at. Now, any of you who might be Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic, you've been taught that there are five apostolic sees. They claim that there are five places that there was succession from the apostles. Now, there's actually more than five. There's two or three other little places that I'm not going to mention here that have been speculated. There's actually a sixth, which is what, what I think is the most important. But they claim that there are five. Rome, so people have heard of the Vatican, so know about that one. Alexandria, Egypt. Antioch. Uh, Jerusalem and Constantinople. And we have an article about apostolic succession, what, what the issues are with all that. But according to Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox scholars, there was another one. They call it the Ephesus Sea. And the Ephesus Sea is what we would call the Smyrna Church Era. Now they believe it basically started with the Apostle, uh, I should say, Paul, who put Timothy in charge, but then the, the John came there, and so John was in charge, and then he was succeeded by uh, uh, Polycarp of Smyrna, et cetera, et cetera, and that leads into the, the Smyrna church era. And the Church of Rome and the Eastern Orthodox and other scholars say, well, that basically died out. But the reality is they do accept that there was this apostolic succession in this region, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, as far as the Catholics go, Here's something from the Catholic Encyclopedia about Smyrna. It says Smyrna. Christianity was preached to the inhabitants at an early date. As early as the year 93, there exists a Christian community there directed by a bishop whom St. John the Apocalypse only had words of praise. There are other Christians in the vicinity of the city dependent on it whom St. Polycarp wrote letters to. When Polycarp was martyred, the Church of Smyrna sent an encyclical concerning his death to the church in Philomelium and others. So, according to the Church of Rome, the Smyrna Church was faithful to apostolic teachings. This is extremely important to us in the continuing Church of God. Why, is, why would that be important? Why do we care? The Church of Rome, some of their saints have also said the first 15 bishops of Jerusalem, these are the ones up to 135, were faithful. They're saying the Smyrna Church was faithful. Well, if you look at the doctrines that the people in Jerusalem kept through 135 AD and the people in Polycarp's region kept, you're going to notice they have a lot more in common what we teach in Continuing Church of God than what the Roman Catholics teach, the Protestants teach, or the Eastern Orthodox teach. This is one of the reasons this is so important. Now, let me read something from the uh, old uh, Worldwide Church of God about this. Uh, this is from uh, Herbert Armstrong from Good News Magazine in 1981, December. It says it's significant that after his release, John trained Polycarp, elder, elder of Smyrna, 
near Ephesus, in a province of Asia or Asia Minor. And Smyrna follows Ephesus, he says, according to Revelation. And that's what we teach. The church hours, this came next. It said, and Smyrna, Polycarp presided over the Church of God for half a century after John's death. And let me comment that a letter written by Ignatius of, Alexand of Antioch said it was the Church of God in Smyrna. It was called the Church of God, by the way, amongst other things. It said, Polycarp boldly stood up for the truth while many fell away. We'll talk about that later. History relates that following examples of Peter, Paul, and John, Polycarp wrote many letters to congregations, though pretty much all are gone. We, we, we have one called uh, the Letter to the Philippians, which actually I wrote an article on it that was published in the Theological Journal years ago. Um, and it, you can find that version of that at uh, the cogwriter.com website. Then it says in this article by Herbert Armstrong, in old age, Polycarp journeyed to Rome over the matter of Passover. His mission was not a success. He said the Bishop of Rome, Anicetus, observed communion on Sunday. He wouldn't change his mind. Then it says Polycarp was uh, killed by being burned to death, which, which happened. Uh, furthermore, going back in uh, to December of 76, uh, Garner Ted Armstrong wrote some things about this. He said the church Jesus started, and he talks about uh, the works and tribulations of poverty of the Church of God in Smyrna. And he said that the closing verse to the letter of Smyrna, but he's got an ear to hear, is important. And he warns, he warned here that the time will come that the people in the church will be martyred. Now this is important because there were some leaders in my old Church of God group who didn't understand that Philadelphians are subject to getting persecuted or martyred prior to the start of the Great Tribulation. But this was the position of the old Worldwide Church of God, at least back in December 1976. And it's still been my position the whole time. So, uh, that, so this was says, Smyrna faithful unto death. One of the reasons I decided to read some of the old Church of God literature is because I seem to have talked about Smyrna more than I've heard in other churches of God I've been in, and I wanted to look and say, no, historically the Church of God did teach this, and so I'm not teaching anything new that particular way. Now, we've got a person by name of uh, Papias, and he's an ancient man, and he was a hearer of John and a friend of Polycarp. And then we've got Irenaeus said he's he wrote, of Leon. He wrote around 170 A.D. Talk about the place the blessed Polycarp used to sit where he spoke, and uh, that he would say he used to talk with the Apostle John and the rest who'd seen the Lord and how we relate their words. Now this is important. It's important because Irenaeus is saying Polycarp knew the apostles, he talked to the apostles, he knew them. So what he and the people there taught, yes, they had the Bible. And yes, by, I mean, at that time, okay? And actually, in the article I had published about the letter to the Philippians, I showed that Polycarp quoted or alluded to every one of the books of the New Testament in that one letter. In the one letter. The Church of God in Smyrna had the entire New Testament uh, the, the whole time they were there. So they knew what the scriptures were. But, you know, if you read the Bible now, you might have some questions. And Polycarp probably had some questions. And according to Irenaeus, he talked to the apostles about it. The, the apostle John is believed to live to at least 100 A.D., and Polycarp, by the way, uh, lived a long time and would have been with, uh, uh, with, with John for probably a couple of decades. So not just like a week or something. It's, it's, it's probably several decades, and we'll get uh, more, more into that. Okay. And uh, the, the, the Catholics acknowledge that uh, Polycarp uh, uh, had, had Smyrna, and he's talking about the uh, bishops of seven principal churches of Asia Minor. And Smyrna was one of them. And Irenaeus wrote, he said, the Ephesians, the Ephesians greet you from Smyrna, where I'm writing you. They have refreshed me in every respect, together with Polycarp, the bishop of the Smyrnians. And that was probably written, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I said this is from... Uh, Ignatius, but uh, I've got this from Irenaeus, but these were things were written not too long after John died. 
Uh, now, according to something called the Apostolic Constitutions, which, by the way, this stuff we don't necessarily agree is right. We don't believe the apostles did, did it. They claimed that the apostles John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew taught the laying on of hands for like deacons and all this kind of stuff. And that is a practice in the Bible. And so uh, even though the apostolic constitutions were not really a constitution written by the apostles, the people who wrote it did have some understanding of some of the things that the apostles taught. And again, this is in the uh, second or third century uh, AD, which is again during the time of the Smyrna church. Now, one thing that uh, I saw from a Catholic website, and some of you may have heard me say this before, they claim that Polycarp endorsed infant baptism, the Apostle John endorsed infant baptism. Because when Polycarp was martyred, he said they wanted Polycarp to uh, denounce uh, Jesus. And uh, I said this before, I think Polycarp had a sense of humor. They said, look, Polycarp, you're an old man. We don't really want to kill you. Just say death to the atheists. Christians were called atheists, by the way, because they didn't worship the, the gods of the Romans. So just say death to the atheists, and we'll let you live. So he looks out the crowd. So I won't look at you people. And say When I say this, I'll look at the blank wall. Pretend that's the crowd. He looks at the, the pagans. Says, death to the atheists. Well, the government officials weren't so sure about this. Doesn't sound like he necessarily, he said what he told them to say, but they weren't sure he really meant what they wanted. So he said, look, just renounce Jesus. Okay, we don't want to kill you. Please, come on, just pronounce Jesus. It's not so big a deal, right? Just say this. We don't want to kill you. No. But Polycarp says, 80 and 6 years have I served him, and he hasn't let me down, and I'm not going to betray him now. So they killed him. Now, you get people, including certain Roman Catholic writers and others, say, aha! 86 years he served him. That's when he, was, he got killed when he was 86. He was baptized as an infant. The Apostle John must have baptized him. Therefore, infant baptism is right. Wrong. I ran across something. It's called the Harris Fragments. This didn't get translated until 1999. But I found this. And I looked at the Greek and looked this up. It said Polycarp is an old man, 104 years old. And he continued to walk in the canons, which he'd learned from his, in his youth from the Apostle John, which tells us two or three things. One, 104 minus 86, he was baptized, he was 18 in the Church of God. So was I. Okay, that does not make me an infant at 18. I'm kind of young for a Church of God person to get baptized, but so I was not an infant, and neither was Polycarp. Number two, said he continued to walk in the canons he received from the Apostle John. Now, understand that when this document came out, the Harris Fragments, they may have been talking about the books of the Bible as the canon. Okay? So this is a confirmation that John passed the canon on to Polycarp, which, by the way, which is what we teach. And if it doesn't mean the literal books, it means the ways of how you're supposed to go. Okay? And so we did that. Now, somewhere, and maybe the Eastern Orthodox had access to something like the Harris Fragments before, from uh, the Coptic Orthodox Diocese of the Southern United States, they said that Polycarp was appointed to Bishop of the See of Smyrna by the Apostles himself at age 40. And I found some other things within the writings of the Eastern Orthodox that suggest that Polycarp was 104 when he died. So be careful when people partially tell you about church history. As I said, this one Catholic site, oh, this proves infant baptism. It does not. And we've got, uh, you know, uh, let me see, think for a second. Herman Armstrong made a comment about uh, Polycarp and going to, uh, to Rome. And he did do that. And Valentinus uh, was, was, what, was a heretic that was over there. So let me just talk a little bit about what happened to Polycarp at Rome. This is from Irenaeus, Against Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 4. It says, Valentinus came to Rome in the time of Bishop Hygienus, Flourish under would be Bishop Pius and remain until uh, Anicetus. Anicetus for sure was called the bishop, the other one not necessarily. Then Marcion succeeded in flourishing under Anicetus. But Polycarp was not only instructed by the apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but also was by the apostles in Asia appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna. While the Church of Rome claims that 
Peter somehow appointed Linus as his successor, there is no contemporary document that says there's nothing that says this. Years ago, when then Pope Benedict XVI was explaining apostolic succession, I was wondering, since he's a scholar, how is he going to say this? And to his credit, he said it right, but it was still misleading. He said it's by tradition that we have this succession. We don't have it by tradition, we have it in writing. Okay? In multiple sources, it says Polycarp, who is one of our guys, was appointed by an apostle. So the truest apostolic succession that we know about for any length of time went that way. And it says, by the way, that when uh, Polycarp went to Rome, he, was more, he had more authority than the Roman bishop. And he was said he was a more steadfast, greater weight, more steadfast witness of the truth than Valentinus and Marcion and the rest of the heretics. He came to Rome at the time of Anicetus, and he caused many to turn us away from those heretics to the Church of God. So Polycarp came to Smyrna, said to those people who were attending, by the way, the Church of Rome, Valentinus and Anicetus, with, with Anicetus, Marcion, said, these are, right, these are not right. No, can't do that. Got rid of them, but Rome didn't change on some other things. Okay, and uh, according to the Church of Rome, Valentinus and Marcion were terrible people. Okay, but they tolerated them uh, for quite some time. Matter of fact, they got pushed out. And they came back. They, they finally pushed push them out again. This decades after, after Polycarp denounced them, and I believe by allowing them to stay, that was a factor in some of the changes that happened in the Church of Rome. Now, for those of you with the Church of God background, this is where I'm going to differ a little bit from what you've heard in the past. And I've said this before. I do not believe, by the way, that Simon Peter anointed Linus, who anointed Anacletus, who anointed Alexander. These are some of the early, uh, Clement, early leaders listed uh, for Rome. I think those early people were just elders that were there. And I don't think, I think they held Church of God doctrine. Now, I realize that Simon Magus had his impact there. Don't get me wrong. But some of, we know that Paul was there. We know there were Christians in Rome uh, for, for some period of time. So just a little bit of clarification if you've heard something different. And let's see here. Uh, we've got some different things about early succession. But basically what started to happen over in Rome, uh, definitely in Alexandria, Egypt, and even in the Smyrna area, people were rising up who kind of combined Greek philosophy and Gnostic philosophy with the Bible. But they were going to improve it, and they were going to make it better. And that's kind of what, what they wanted to do. Uh, Polycarp uh, kept the holy days. Uh, from what we've been able to tell, there's something called the life of Polycarp. It indicates that he kept uh, the, the feast days, etc., holy days. And we'll get some more into that later. And historians say that people like Valentinus and the Marcionites uh, were causing all kinds of problems. They covered Egypt and established themselves in Rome. But again, Polycarp went and denounced them. And there were other leaders uh, in the uh, Smyrna church, by the way, who Smyrna church era, who denounced other heretics. Uh, as a matter of fact, I guess I'll mention this now. We have a booklet here called The Continuing History of the Church of God. This is available at the ccog.org website, ccog.org website. And in it, uh, I'll open to this, you'll be able to see this a little bit. You see the, the heretic, or the apostate, their heresy, and who denounced them. And we see that uh, uh, Polycarp uh, denounced uh, some, the Apostle John and Pilate, uh, did some, Theophilus of Antioch, who was a Church of God leader during the time of, Antioch, of uh, Smyrna, Melito of Sardis, who was a Church of God leader there around 170. Uh, so what else we have here? Uh, Polycrates, uh, who was a Church of God leader out of Ephesus. Thracius and Apollonius. These are people that the, the Church of Rome considers to be their saints. But they were our people, and they denounced various heresies. And many of these heresies were eventually adopted by the, the Church of Rome, the Eastern Orthodox, and or the Protestant churches, but we in the Continuing Church of God do not have till this day. Polycarp wrote, whoever does not confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is the Antichrist. 
is Antichrist, and if he doesn't accept his testimony, is of the devil, if they pervert the words of God to their own lusts, said there's no resurrection or a judgment, you're the firstborn of Satan. Now here's the next part that Polycarp wrote that's very interesting. He said that Christians were supposed to forsake the vanity of many and their false doctrines. By the time of Polycarp, there were the many who were doing false doctrines. Now I tried to explain something to this one Catholic I was sitting by an airplane and I think it went a little beyond him because he'd never heard anything like this before. He thought he was highly educated but because they're educated a certain way. And I told them that up until about 135 A.D., the, most of the church in uh, Jerusalem, they were faithful. Up to about 210 A.D., in Antioch, they were faithful. Up to about 250 A.D., in Asia Minor, in general, they were, they were faithful. Okay? Rome, to about 110 A.D., 120 A.D., somewhere around then, we don't know precisely. Uh, and I probably missed one of the C's, but... Uh, so uh, basically, if you know that, then you know who, which people you can consider to be reliable. And you actually, I did this based on what they teach. And we'll, we'll go to this a little bit further. And there's a book called, uh, I bought this book called The Church of Smyrna, History and Theology of a Primitive Christian Community. It came out in 2015. And I was hoping it would have some of the stuff I'm going over and it doesn't, but it has one good quote. So I'll read the one quote. Polycarp, well, it's got a couple of good quotes, but in this case, Polycarp's letter to the Philippians invites his recipients to abandon the vanity of the multitude and their false doctrines to return to the word which was transmitted from the beginning. In other words, this source says, the Smyrna Church said you're supposed to believe the original Christian church. There's original teachings. And that's what we, we do. Um... I'll read a couple of doctrines that Polycarp taught. He said, He who raised him up from the dead will raise us up also if we do his will and walk in his commandments. Now, Protestants say Polycarp was a saint. Well, you start looking at what Polycarp wrote. Not all the Protestants agree with that. We're supposed to love what he loved, keeping ourselves from all unrighteousness, covetousness, love of money, evil speaking, false witnessing. Okay? Polycarp wrote, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. We brought nothing into the world, we'll take nothing out. First of all, let us walk in the commandments. Next, teach your wives to walk in the faith given to them in love and purity, tenderly loving their own husbands in all truth and loving others, all others equally in all chastity. Train their children up in the knowledge and fear of God. Teach the widows to be discreet as respects to the faith of the Lord. Praying continually for all being from all slandering, evil speaking, false witnesses, love of money, and every kind of evil. Know that God is not mocked. Well, to walk worthy of his commandment and glory. It says, neither fornicators nor feminine nor abusers themselves with mankind shall inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, we teach that. That was still taught back then. Nor those do, who do things inconsistent, unbecoming. I exhort you to abstain from covetousness, that you be chaste and truthful, abstain from every form of evil. If you can't govern yourself in such matters, how can you tell it to each others? If you don't keep yourself from covetousness, you're defiled by you'll be defiled by idolatry. And be judged as one of the heathen. So we're not supposed to be like the heathen. This is what Polycarp wrote. Now Polycarp was actually arrested on a day of preparation called the Great Sabbath, according to the martyrdom of Polycarp. So the fact that it was written that way strongly suggests that, and I think is total proof and evidence, that Polycarp was keeping the Sabbath on Saturday. Now, there was somebody else called Theophilus of Antioch. Now, he came a little after Polycarp. Polycarp was probably killed between 155 and 160, plus or minus. Theophilus of Antioch probably wrote around 170, 180 A.D., this is the second century. And he wrote, On the sixth day God finished his works which he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the works which he made. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all the works which God began to create. Moreover, concerning the seventh day, which all men acknowledge, but most know not 
that what the Hebrews is called the Sabbath is translated in Greek as seventh, name which is adopted by every nation, even though they don't know the reason for this. God, having thus completed the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them, on the seventh day, re sixth day, rest on the seventh day from all his works which he made. He said, now we confess that God alone exists. He's one. He's the creator, maker of the universe. And we've learned a holy law. We have him as a, holy, as a lawgiver who's really God. He teaches us to act righteously and to be pious. We're supposed to have no other gods before him. Honor the mother and father. Uh, not steal. Bear false witness. Don't cover the neighbor's wives. Uh, divine law of Moses was given. He cites this to the world, chiefly the Hebrews, of this great and wonderful law which tends towards all righteousness. The ten heads are such as we already rehearsed. So he calls the Ten Commandments the Ten Heads. And by the way, in case you notice, he didn't say that the Sabbath was switched to Sunday. Okay? And he was also in that area. Now what's interesting, when you research this in more depth, what you find is there are no... The only communication we have between Rome and Asia Minor is negative. Polycarp went there, tried to get Anastasius to change. He didn't change. He did turn some people away from Valentinus and Marcion. Then later we've got a guy named Polycrates, which I'll get to, told the Bishop of Rome he wasn't going to listen to him. I'm changing the day of the Passover. That's it. But we actually have letters from the Asia Minor people to the Antioch people. And they all agreed with each other. That's how come we know who was on first and who was on second. So they all kept Sabbath. They all kept Passover on the 14th. They all kept the Holy Days. They also didn't eat unclean meat and some other things like that. We'll see how much of this I might get to. Since I'm uh, one-sixth of the way done and I'm uh, more than, I use more than a third of my time. <laughs> okay, well I mentioned this one and I've read this before and this is from uh, uh, Irenaeus and he said that uh, Polycarp, when he went to Rome at the time of Ana, uh, Anicetus, and Herbert Armstrong alluded to this, he tried to persuade Anicetus to keep Passover the right day. Because Polycarp said this is what was observed by the Apostle John. He said, look, I saw John. I knew John. He kept Passover on the 14th. Okay? And he says, no, a couple of people before me, they started going on Sunday. Now, the reason he went on Sunday, by the way, was this revolt of the Jews, the Bar Kokhba revolt, which lasted from 132 to 135 AD. And I mentioned that Hadrian said the Jewish were not allowed back in Jerusalem. Well, if you look kind of Jewish, because the Christians were considered Jews, by the way, we were originally considered a sect of the Jews. So there were people in Rome who started compromising around 135, maybe some before then. So we think for sure that's by the time they switched to Passover on Sunday, because they didn't want it to look different than the Jews. So no, we're not like the Jews. We don't do... We're good. Wait, Sunday, it's your day. It's the day of the sun. Sun God, Mithras, and all this stuff. They tried to be like them. Polycarp said, no, that's wrong. you got to go on the day the apostles kept it. No, can't do that. No, can't do. We're going to do the wrong thing. And that's in, that's in the record. And while you might think that the day of Passover is not the most important thing, and it's not the most important thing, but it's very interesting because the apostle John warned that there were those who said they were of him, but they, he said if they were of us, they would keep doing what we did. But they didn't. This is one of, that's from one of John's epistles. I should have quoted the precise one. Sorry about that. But Passover, the date of change of Passover is the easiest thing to show. Almost all legitimate scholars will tell you the early Christians kept Passover on the 14th. And it got changed to Sunday by most people. Okay? Believe it or not, by the way, and I did not know this growing up Roman Catholic, Easter Sunday is supposed to be Passover. I know it's not kept as a commemoration of Jesus' death, which Passover was, but the Catholic excuse me, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says Easter is Passover. I don't agree, but I'm just telling you, and it's through church history it's easy to prove this one thing. So if you are Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic or Protestant and you don't keep Passover on the 14th, you're not doing what the early church did. You're not doing what the Apostle John did and the early faithful followers of the church. There's a Catholic writer named Epiphanius, a historian, and he said that 
There were people who chose to celebrate Passover the same day the Jews do, as well as when the Jews are keeping their festival of unleavened bread. And Epiphanius actually wrote, and indeed, that used to be the church's custom. Okay? So, late 4th, early 5th century, Epiphanius and his Panerion of Epiphanius, books 2 and 3, said the church's custom used to be to do this. And so, that's, that's out there. Uh, and this is not some unknown thing. Now, I, re I realize if you're Catholic or Protestant or Eastern Orthodox, your priest or minister doesn't usually teach you about this stuff. They probably learned about it in seminary. But they don't tell you, because they tell you you might have some questions. If you look at church history, I'll tell you a story. There's this famous person, and I'll mention his name. His name is Bart Ehrman. He's out of University of North Carolina, I think Chapel Hill. He's got a bunch of books in the bookstore. He used to be kind of an on-fire evangelical type. So he goes to seminary, he starts studying church history. Now I listened to 12 hours of his lectures on church history, okay, and I listened to them all twice, or, or maybe three times, to make sure I understood what the guy was teaching, and I've read some of his books. He's basically thrown his hands up. He said there were a bunch of Christianities, and what ended up being the main stuff, says, could have been something else. So he threw up his hands. The Church of Rome historians, by the way, they do it a different way. They say, yeah, all these people disagree. But in the end, they went the way of Rome. Therefore, Rome is right. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say might makes right or the many, the many makes right. Okay? The Bible says, contend earnestly for the faith once for all the saints. Jesus said, wide and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Straight and narrow is the way to righteousness. And few are going to find it. Because the criteria wasn't the numbers. But this is what, what Rome uses. And the Protestants, by the way, if they actually look at church history, they will not find a religion that resembles theirs back in the second century. It's not there. They think it's there, but it's, it's not. It's not the original faith uh, either. Anyway, we've got a book on the Continuing History of Church of God. Go to ccug.org, click on the Literature tab under Books Booklets, and the books show up. They're free online. And this book has hundreds of references plus scripture. Um, Things got uh, interesting. Now, a lot of times people consider people like uh, Constantine to be a Christian emperor. Emperor Constantine rose in the 4th century. He was not Christian by our definition of the term. Uh, he was a persecuting individual. He signed an edict against heretics. Uh, he decided Passover had to be celebrated on Sunday. Church should be on Sunday. And then it got worse after him. And that was uh, Emperor Theodosius put out certain edicts between 380 and 394 A.D. Basically it says, you will be killed if you keep Passover on the 14th. Now, how can he be considered a Christian emperor? Killing people for keeping Passover the same day. Jesus kept it, John kept it, the apostles kept it. People, people like Polycarp, etc. kept it. And they did that. And part of it was when Constantine arose, he was militaristic, and the early Christians were not militaristic either. In... Uh, Laodicea, which is also in Asia Minor, uh, around 364 A.D., they passed Canon Number 29, and they said that Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work rather on that day. Uh, and that indicates, by the way, that Christians were go keep, so, or some people were keeping Saturday as the Sabbath. And it's interesting, the Eastern Orthodox, by the way, will tell you that Saturday is the Sabbath. They actually kind of keep two days. They don't keep the Sabbath the way we keep it, but they acknowledge that because they know that's the case. Um, sometimes people have asked questions about the term Catholic Church. Now, I offended somebody in my old uh, COG when I tried to tell him the truth about this. He didn't want to hear this. I'm going to read something from the Catholic Encyclopedia. It says, the combination Catholic Church, which in Greek is, let me see if I can pronounce this, He Catholique Ecclesia, is found for the first time in St. Ignatius' letter to the Smyrnians. Wheresoever the bishop or pastor appears, let the people be, even where Jesus may be, there is the universal or the Catholic Church. And the second reference is the bishop of the Catholic Church in Smyrna, which is a reference to Polycarp. 
according to the Catholic uh, Encyclopedia. And so, and Ignatius, by the way, he wrote, and this is his letter to the Smyrnians, to the Church of God, which is at Smyrna in Asia. And he referred to that as the Catholic Church. So they considered that to be the Catholic Church, the universal church. And later, I mentioned Theodosius, when they changed the nature of the Godhead, they declared that if you would not accept the Trinitarian nature of God, that you could not use the term Catholic Church. So the Church of God people stopped using it because they didn't want to get killed. But that's where it came from, and that's why the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics use it, is because it came from a council. It doesn't come from the, from the Bible. And by the way, Ignatius wrote a letter, said to Polycarp, Bishop of the Church of the Smyrnians. Why is this important? Because we have letters written to Polycarp, from Polycarp, when he died about Polycarp, People said they knew Polycarp and that, the, that he was in charge and he was a bishop and he wrote and he got a couple letters from him. We do not have that on some of these other so-called leaders as these so-called other, other sees. And he wrote again the Church of God uh, that sojourns in Smyrna. So the term Church of God was, was used as well. Um, not that anyone's going to be able to see this very, very well, but I'm going to hold this up for a moment and then I'll talk about this for just a moment. This is a list of early bishops or pastors. We have a succession list, by the way, and ours is real. Polycarp, uh, succeeded by Thrasius, succeeded by Segarus, succeeded by Papirius, then Melito, then Apollinaris, then Polycrates, then, then Apollonius, then uh, Camarius of Smyrna. But there was this other guy. His name was... Uh, Eudaimon of Smyrna, he was in charge, but he compromised. So he was the top person, if you will. He compromised and worshiped in the sacrifice of the pagans. But there was a guy who was an elder at the time. His name was Peonius of Smyrna. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't eat unclean meat. He wouldn't do it. He allowed himself to get killed. So even though people thought this one guy was a faithful guy, he wasn't. And we've seen this throughout Church of God history. We've seen people who we thought were supposed to be the leader, who would be faithful, who was not. That doesn't mean if, if a leader of a church or a minister makes a mistake, that means they've fallen away. But this guy clearly compromised. He had a clear opportunity to do the right thing. He refused to do it, and he wouldn't do it. And we saw this uh, in the uh, late 20th century from the succession of the old worldwide Church of God. And from time to time throughout church history, we've seen this happen, which is... Uh, I guess a tester trial that God wants us all to go through. But, but so we have leaders up until about 250 A.D. in uh, Smyrna, in Asia Minor. And I've got a quote, and I'm not going to read it here, but because of this compromise and particular persecution that happened, there was a letter from one of the uh, Greco-Roman bishops that said, finally, we have unity in Asia Minor. Because they didn't. The predominant church Christian church in Asia Minor until around 250 was the Church of God. Okay? No, we still existed, some of us near Antioch, and some of us near Jerusalem, and some of us near Rome or in Rome, I think. We had some in Rome at the time. And probably up in England and in France and other places. There were, there were people and down in Ethiopia and parts of Africa. Okay, it's not that we didn't have any, but the main body happened to be in Asia Minor, and we were the leading part. Uh, for quite some time. And well, one of our leaders by the name of Thracius, he was an adversary of Montanism. Uh, Montanist was the first person to make a statement, I am the Father, the Son, and the Paraclete, which means Holy Spirit. Um, the Church of God, by the way, in Smyrna, held what's called a Benetarian formula of the Godhead. Now, most people haven't heard of that term. Now, I'm going to read from Monroy's book, The Church of Smyrna, History and Theology of a Primitive Christian Community. As for the Binitarian confessional formula, which confesses the Father and the Son, we likewise find examples in Polycarp and Ignatius. Well, let me tell you, they aren't the only ones. You can find it in Irenaeus, even Justin Martyr, who, these, the last two I said were not Church of God leaders, basically taught that the Father was God, and the Son was God, and the Holy Spirit was the power of God. Uh, what we know, what's now 
called the Trinity was not something that was taught and accepted back then. Uh, in addition to this, uh, Apollonius, uh, Apollonius also uh, went against Montanus, and Apollonius also kept Passover on the 14th, so he was one of our people. And Serapion, who uh, uh, succeeded uh, Max, Maximus at the time as Bishop of Antioch, he also uh, kept Passover on the 14th. And he also, by the way, mentioned a couple of other things. He warned, this is around 200 to 210 AD, he warned that a lying confederacy was forming. After he died, the people who took over, in my opinion, were part of that lying confederacy. This is in actual church history. Well, the Protestants don't want to look at this because they start looking at church history. Wait a second. Protestants, we don't go to church on Saturday. We like to eat unclean meats, or most, many of them. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. They don't keep the biblical holy days. They don't want to keep Passover on the 14th. And they're Trinitarian. Early Christians were not. I may have told this story before, but I'll tell you one more time. I took this class at Fuller Theological Seminary on church history. And someone saw this book in my office. He tells his wife, hey, I haven't seen that book since I took church history at Fuller Theological. I said, I took that. And they had a, a book on the, called The Trinitarian Controversy. And if you read that book, by the way, it says, in this book, the Bible, the Apostle Paul uses a Binitarian formula all the time for the Godhead. Okay? And so this guy says to me, who went to Fuller, this is part of their graduate master's program, said, what's your Christology? I said, oh, I believe what the early Christ Christians believed. That's all I said. He says to me, then you're not Trinitarian. And he was. I never saw him again. Okay, and that's probably why, <laughs> because I told him that. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about the Church of God in uh, Smyrna, in the Smyrnians, is that uh, I mentioned Serapion. Serapion went and he visited some people near Alexandria. And he got there and they were looking, using the Gospel of Peter. He said, I visited you because I thought you were part of the true church. But you're reading this stuff. Rome and parts of Alexandria were reading the Gospel of Peter. So was the origin of Alexandria. But our people weren't. So people say there was confusion about the canon. That's not true. I mean, there is confusion. The Greco-Roman Protestant types had confusion. We didn't. We knew the books. The books were passed from John to Polycarp. In case you didn't know, Jesus Christ had John pen the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the New Testament was written. Okay, John was the last of the apostles to have died according to tradition as far as we know. He would have had the last book and he passed them on to Polycarp. We never were confused about those particular uh, books. Uh, there was some confusion that did rise up about which books of the Old Testament Probably some people brought up these extra books that you'll find in the Roman Catholic and the uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, Bibles. Well, Melito of Sardis, who's one of our guys, he went down to Jerusalem and he met with people and they told him, no, no, just the ones that we use in this book are the right ones. And by the way, if you are Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic and you use those other books and you think they're fine, I want to tell you that even according to the Catholic and Orthodox Saint Jerome, those books should not have been in the Bible. He put them in there because he was, said he was ordered to, but they, he just said they should not have been in there, and I agree with him. They also had some other books they used. Um, Melito of Sardis was against the use of tradition and for idols. He said, don't use idols, we don't care. They, they're not God. You might say they, it's for God's image. He says, look, he said, it's a, to honor God we make this, so we may worship the God who's concealed from our view. Melito said, no, no idols, can't do that stuff. Uh, he also endorsed the millennium. Why is that important? They consider uh, the, the Roman, Greco-Roman types, Protestants, Protestants not so much, they don't know about church history, but the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholics, and Melito was a saint. He endorsed the millennium, uh, a Roman Catholic council attended by the Eastern Orthodox denounced the uh, uh, millennium and said it's an anathema if you teach that but but he did I mentioned before Papias of Heropolis he probably died around 110 AD plus or minus he taught the millennium as well Catholic Encyclopedia admits that Melito Sardis taught the millennium I'm just seeing this the, who taught against it Marcion the same Marcion that Polycarp when he went to Rome 
blasted. First person we know of who blasted the millennium was Marcion, who was a heretic or apostate. Simon Magus might have as well, but we don't have that detail, but we do have the detail about Mar Marcion. Okay. All right. Uh, whether what day the, uh, you keep Passover was considered to be important, uh, according to uh, Irenaeus, who is a church historian, that uh, the Roman Catholics say he and Tertullian were the two most important early church historians. He said, a question of no small importance arose at this time, for all the parishes of Asia, Asia Minor, hold that the 14th day of the month, on which the day the Jews were commanded to sacrifice the lamb, should be observed as the feast of the Savior's Passover. So there's no doubt. The Savior's Passover. Okay, this is what Christians were keeping. But it wasn't the custom of the churches of the rest of the world by the end of the third century, second, beginning of the third century. So around toward the end of the second century, the bishops of Asia, led by Polycrates, uh, would not switch. And Polycrates wrote a letter to the bishop of Rome. And by the way, the bishops of Rome were not called popes then. And actually, probably not before 140 were they even called bishops. Uh, there's a, some argument there that the Catholic scholars would tell you, well, maybe 130, maybe 150, somewhere around then they were called bishops uh, or pastors. Anyway, Polycrates wrote, says, we observed the exact day. We didn't add to it. We didn't take it away. For an Asian minor, great lights have fallen asleep. They're going to rise again the day of the Lord's coming. We we'll teach them when you die, you're dead until the resurrection, which we teach in the Church of God as well. He says, among those who died were uh, Philip, one of the twelve apostles, his two uh, virgin daughters, another daughter, died in Ephesus. John, who was a witness and teacher, reclined in the bosom of the Lord. He died in Ephesus. So this is why we believe he was, because Polycrates is one of our guys. Uh, Polycarp of Smyrna, Thracius of Smyrna, Sigaris, Papyrus, Melito. These all kept Passover on the 14th day according to the gospel, deviating in no respect but following the rule of faith. And I, Polycrates, the least of all of you, do the same thing. Uh, and I keep Passover uh, with the days the Jews put out the leaven. Greater men than I have said we ought to obey God rather than men. And so, what is he, it's what he said. And according to a Catholic scholar by the name of a uh, uh, Duffy, he thinks that what was happening was there were some people in Rome who wanted to keep Passover on the 14th and they wouldn't switch and they wrote Asia Minor. And Asia Minor guys wrote, no, we're not going to do this. This is what the Bible teaches and that we're, that we're going to do. Uh, also, during the time of uh, Smyrna, there was an African bishop by the name of Nepos. And he was very well respected because they knew he knew the truth. But they didn't like him so much. And he is one who is believed to have... Uh, he taught the millennium, and he taught the scriptures, and he didn't want to change things. He taught the resurrection of the dead. Okay? And um, even when he was criticized, they had to be careful, because everybody respected this guy. But he was actually... He was, he was an African, taught the millennium. As far as I can tell from what little writings we have of him, he's one of our guys, too. Now, I mentioned Tertullian before. I'm through half the pages, so, but no, I won't go twice as long. Tertullian was a Catholic theologian, and he lived during the time of Polycrates. Now, regarding the identity of the true church, he wrote, the real question is, to who does the faith belong? And whose are the scriptures? He said, the answer is plain. Christ sent his apostles, who founded the churches in each city, from which others have borrowed the tradition of faith and the seed of doctrine to become churches. So they're uh, apostolic. And he says, the other groups, the heresies, he says they're novelties. They just kind of popped up. They don't have any conti uh, continuity with the teaching of Christ. He said they might claim uh, antiquity from the apostles. He said, then let's see who your bishops are. He says he can only find, he, he finds two groups. He says, the Smyrnians count from Polycarp and John, those are our people, and the Romans from Clement and Peter. 
Now the Romans, by the way, they switched it to Linus, but put Clement in later. Now, he said, let the heretics do something to match this. Now, if, at first read of this, if you don't know church history, he's, you think he's saying that the Church of Rome and the Church of Smyrna is the same. No. He had to know by this time they didn't go get along. Polycarp went to Rome and denounced them. Polycrates said, we ain't going to listen to you. Okay? He had to know that they were different. That there's only one of those two had apostolic succession. And I found a, a skeptic site, anti-Bible kind of stuff. Then it says, listen to this. He says, despite all the propaganda, early second century Christian tradition was only to make two claims of apostolic succession. Polycarp of Smyrna or Clement of Rome. So that was the only two. So the skeptic saying, forget all the rest of this. And the skeptic knows that nobody else claims Polycarp of Smyrna. Now, I say nobody else, I want to step back on this for a moment. I started to write this a decade or so ago. Okay? After I did it, there's a group that claims to be of some tie to Eastern Orthodox, and they've got their uh, patriarch. He's got my list with my dates. I thought that was a bizarre coincidence, because I didn't get it from them. I will assure you. I, I got it from what I could find, and some of the dates I got from the Catholics, I didn't, Roman Catholics. I did not get them from the Orthodox. So when I saw my list, I was kind of shocked. So I asked him, so I found the guy's phone number, and he was willing to talk to me, by the way. So where would you get this list? Oh, it was here before I got, before the item was made. And it was shortly after I put it online. It was about two years after I put it online, he came up with it. So I thought it was funny. But we, we claim it. Um, we've got some information that, uh, uh, that the days of leavened bread were kept uh, by uh, the Church of God in Smyrna. And I'm not going to go through all of the proof of that right now. One of the other things that I've said before, and this is during the time of uh, Smyrna, was the adherence to what uh, a Catholic writer by the name of Pixner calls the observance of the Jewish holy days. And he said that that kind of separated from the Jews from, from the Gentiles, but not completely. One of the great saints according to the Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, this guy by the name of John Chrysostom. And I've mentioned him before. If you go to the Vatican, you go to St. Peter's, there's this big black throne. It's got four legs. Four guys under it. Well, we're going to talk about one. One of them is John Chrysostom. He's one of the legs that holds up to their church. 387 A.D. said, The festivals of pitiful, miserable Jews will soon be upon us, one after the other. Feasts of trumpets, tabernacles, and the fasts. And many are trying to keep them. If the Jewish ceremonies are venerable and great, ours are lies. Does God hate their festivals, or do you share in them? Okay? And he calls the Day of Atonement the wicked and unclean fast of the Jews. Okay? This guy was a racist, anti-Semite. Okay? And he knew that the law fixed the Feast of Tabernacles. He even said that, but he didn't keep it. But bizarrely, he thought he was keeping Passover, which is also supposedly one of the feasts of the Jews, and Pentecost which is supposedly one of the pieces of Jews. It's kind of interesting how that works. But the reality is this shows that in the late 4th century, there were people professing Christ in Asia Minor, keeping the holy days. And I won't read all this stuff there. These guys knew that God had a plan for uh, eternity. Polycarp wrote about our, our eternal reward. Uh, Melito uh, pretty well as well. And it, we were going to leave from the tyranny of this world to an eternal kingdom, so they understood the plan. Uh, I'm not going to read this, but if you've read the uh, uh, Church of God uh, explanation about Samuel uh, supposedly talking to Saul in the Old Testament, and that uh, Peonia said, no, uh, Saul, uh, Samuel was not raised by a witch, I'm not going to read this, but you can go to my article in the Smyrna Church era, and I got all this stuff from Peonius, which sounds very similar to what the old Worldwide Church Guide used to teach. And so, and then it talks about his particular martyrdom. I want to go through a brief list. Now this list, I'll hold this up for a moment, but you can also find this in our book, The Continuing History of Church of God at ccg.org. And you can barely see this here, but if you go to my article, almost all of these are underlined, which means for each of these doctrines that I'm about to say, there's a full article. 
So you don't have to take my word for it. This is what these people taught. You can go look up any one of these that you doubt. Baptism was by immersion and only for adults. The complete Bible, the proper Old and New Testament, was relied on by the church in Asia Minor. A binitarian view of the Godhead was held by the apostolic and post-apostolic true uh, Christian leaders. Birthdays were not celebrated. Celibacy for bishops and elders was not a requirement. Christmas was not observed by anybody for a long time. Church governance was hierarchical. Church services were not ritualistic like modern mass, but more resemble what we do in the continuing church of God. The duties of elders and pastors were pastoral and theological, but not mainly sacrament, a sacramental. They didn't do Easter. They kept all holy days. The Father was considered God. The holy Spirit was not referred to as God or by, as a person. Hymns that were sung were mostly psalms. Idols were taught against. Immorality of the soul of humans was not taught. Jesus was considered God. The kingdom of God was preached. Lent was not observed. Military service was not allowed for the true Christians. The millennium was taught. Monasticism was unheard of. Passover was kept on the 14th. Pentecost was kept on Sunday. And some churches still do that. The resurrection of the dead was taught. The Sabbath was observed on Saturday. Salvation was believed to be offered by cho some chosen now and others later. Sunday was not observed. The Ten Commandments were observed, by the way. Uh, numbered the same way the Eastern Orthodox and the uh, number of them, and we in the continuing church of God number them. Tithes and offerings were given to support the ministry. Tradition had some impact, but not when it was in conflict with Scripture. The Trinity was not a word that was ever used. Unclean meats were not eaten by early Christians, but pe by people who allegorized the Bible, uh, etc. Now, as far as the Trinity, and I'm not going to go into this in great depth, uh, what happens is some people have said that Theophilus of Antioch taught the Trinity. Now, I do plan on doing a full sermon on Theophilus of Antioch, and I've referred to this before, but basically said that there was a, a, a threeness of God, uh, which was basically the Father and the Son, and what happens to what Christians will be when they're resurrected. He did not teach the Holy Spirit was a third member of the Trinity. I mention him because he's the one they go to and say, the first mention of the tr term Trinity or Trinitas was by Theophilus of Antioch in 180 AD. No. He talked about a threeness, but it was not the Trinity the way they teach now at all. I'll skip the ref more references about how the Holy Days were kept. But one thing that I found interesting is from a Catholic scholar. And around the 5th, uh, 6th century, uh, our people were called Nazarenes. Uh, Jerome, 4th century as well. Jerome said that they kept the Old and New Testament, they kept the Sabbath, they believed in the Millennium, didn't keep on clean meats, etc., they believed that Jesus was the Christ, so they, they differed from some other groups. But a Catholic scholar, he sensed disease, deceased, but his name was Bel, Bellarmino Bagatti, said the, the Nazarenes, he says, both St. Epiphanius and St. Jerome, they called them saints, have nothing to condemn our people for except for an observance of customs forbidden by the councils. What councils? These are church councils. The Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople. Done by emperors, not by the Bible. And we were not condemned because we were doing something wrong, commandments of God, but commandments and teachings of men. Protestant scholars know this as well. And I'll just skip oh, through this. Now, one thing that they'll do is they'll point to Peonius. I mentioned him before. And they said, what church do you belong? This is around 250 A.D. He says, the Catholic Church, with Christ there is no other. Now, a Catholic reads this. Roman Catholics, ah! He's referring to the Church of Rome. No, he's not. In Asia Minor, it was the first couple of times the term Catholic Church was used. It was for our people. And he was trying to distinguish it from everybody else, but everybody else decided to take that title. We don't need to use the term anymore. But sometimes if I'll speak with Catholics, I will explain, by the way, we are not Protestant. We precede the Protestant Reformation. Unlike the Baptists, we can show our history in more depth. And one of the issues I think the Baptists have on their history is, according to their theology, nearly everybody who ever lived is going to be condemned. According to our version of history in the Bible, no, God will offer salvation to all who ever lived. But anyway, we can prove our history and our, and our beliefs. Uh, but I will tell Catholics that we are we consider ourselves to be the original faith, uh, in, even including the original Catholic faith, uh, that we believe that they uh, we have some uh, doctrines of agreement with them, 
but we believe they changed many doctrines and don't hold to what we held. And you heard me read the list of doctrines. These are doctrines that we in the Continuing Church of God hold, and the Church of God in Smyrna hold, held those as well. Now, it wasn't just in Asia Minor, as I mentioned before. There were people who went up into Europe and different parts of the world. Uh, I've mentioned uh, uh, Nepos. Uh, we're pretty sure that we have, there were people who went down to Ethiopia. Even to this day, there's a lot of Ethiopians and other Africans, by the way, who keep the Sabbath. Now, many of them are Protestant, uh, but uh, we believe that uh, somebody told, taught somebody who got down there at an early stage which is uh, one of the reasons why the Sabbath is uh, more accepted, if you will, in lots of parts of Africa uh, than around here. Uh, up in Peonius, by the way, in the third century, he was asked about idols and said, no, we don't have them. And this one interesting thing about church history, one of the main writers is a guy by name Eusebius. And he wrote in the fourth century, and this one Protestant source, uh, this is from the Nicene and uh, post-Nicene Fathers. Uh, says, we should add that Melito was a Kiliast, one who believed in the Kiliasm, which is a, a Greek word for millennium or a thousand years. said, we don't see a lot of what he wrote. This can be explained only by his lack, Eusebius' lack of sympathy for Melito's views. There would be more information on millennium out there, by the way, but Eusebius didn't let us see it because it would have offended Emperor Constantine, who's who he wrote his church history for. There's somebody else called Lucy of Antioch, who probably or possibly was one of our people. I'm aware that the uh, uh, Seventh-day Adventists considered them that. Uh, the Paletians, uh, some of them uh, were our people, but not all of them. And one of the issues you have when you go through church history, uh, including Roman Catholic church history, is that the Roman Catholics would have a tendency to give a name to the people, and not everybody with those names was us. Like, for example, if I were to talk to a, 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 a typical Roman Catholic today, they would say we we're Protestant. Why? Because we're not Roman Catholic and we're not Eastern Orthodox. We're not Protestant, but they lump us in. Okay? We can prove we precede the Protestant Reformation and all this kind of stuff. They don't care. Well, back to the same thing. If you didn't agree with the Greco-Roman churches, you were either a Paletian or you were this or you were that. So when you look at church history, you have to be careful. Not everybody called Nazarenes or Ebionites were our people. Not everybody called a Paletian was our people. Uh, or the Boga Mills, etc., etc. These people were there, uh, but just because they had a name, it didn't, uh, it didn't mean it was us. Okay. There were uh, various persecutions that happened uh, uh, to the Church of God in Smyrna. During the time of the Smyrna Church era, Emperor Constantine held his famous uh, Council of uh, Nicaea. According to uh, the Catholic scholar uh, Bellarmino Bagatti, who I mentioned before, he said none of our people were invited. The, other, the Greco-Roman bishops were summoned. They legally had to show up. Our people, he said, they don't think they were invited, and uh, if so, they probably didn't come. One of the reasons would be uh, Emperor Constantine's attitude toward the, the Bible and the true faith was very negative. I'm going to read from Eusebius' Life of Constantine. Constantine supposedly stated, Let us have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd, for we receive from our Savior a different way. And this specifically he's referring to, by the way, keeping Passover on the 14th, which is when Jesus did. Going to church on Saturday, which is what Jesus did. Okay, And he called that the detestable uh, Jewish crowd. Um, also, I should mention that during the time of Emperor Constantine, during the Smyrna time, they had a little test if you lived in Jerusalem. Eat this piece of unclean meat. No. Eat it or we will kill you. That was their little test. They wanted to figure out who was on Constantine's side and who was on the Smyrnian side. Okay, so we have this uh, through the, uh, the records of history. Uh, are there? Anyway, there was a church in the area of Smyrna, in Asia Minor, when... Tertullian used the term Smyrnians. He didn't just mean people from the little 
town of Smyrna, he met all these people from the seven churches in all of Asia Minor. And when I use the term Smyrnians, that's what I mean. The Church of Rome and Eastern Orthodox Church acknowledged that there was what they call the Sea of Ephesus, started by the Apostle John. But, um, and as this included Polycarp, who was from Smyrna, and everybody else throughout history. They know the early leaders that I listed were Christian leaders. Catholic Encyclopedia says Smyrna was faithful. There are only two churches that John was, uh, well, Jesus had John write and didn't, without condemnation. They had warnings, but not condemnation. That was the Church of God in Smyrna and the Church of God in Philadelphia. We, the remnant, the leading remnant of the uh, Church of God of, of Philadelphia, keep the same doctrines and the original faith that those of Smyrna kept. These people knew Koine Greek. They knew how to read the original language of the New Testament. And they asked people who, they actually asked the disciples or people who knew the disciples. Okay, so when we see their doctrine, it's not like they just went off on some hill and came up with some idea. They asked their teachers, which is what they were supposed to do, and they did. So we have said that the, uh, the Smyrna church era probably ran from around 135 A.D., which is the end of Jerusalem and having prominence, to uh, around 4, 450. And we say plus or minus because not all the time we have uh, all, of, all the complete details. But the reality is we in the Continuing Church of God teach the same doctrines that the uh, Smyrnians did. Even though the Church of Rome calls them saints. We have another book that you might want to read, Where's the True Christian Church Today, where we go with some other information, also available at the ccog.org website. If you are in the Continuing Church of God, or interested in being part of the Continuing Church of God, understand that having information about Smyrna is very helpful, because if people ask you questions about your faith and what you believe, you can say, look, Jude said to contend earnestly, earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Apostle John and other apostles appointed Polycarp, etc. in Smyrna. We have writings from those people. Our doctrines agree with those doctrines. They agree with the Bible. They are the original apostolic faith. Your scholars might have different opinions, but they weren't there then. Our leaders were. And what we teach in the Continuing Church of God is consistent with the true teachings of the Smyrna Church era. And I think this is important for all of us because in the book of Daniel... It says it's the time of the end. I'm not going to turn there. It's uh, Daniel 11. We who are, some of God's people are going to instruct many. And by understanding what the early church has taught, you may be among those who are prophesied to instruct many at the end time. This is Dr. Bob Teal, the Continuing Church of God.